The Clunelli's family originates from County Waterford in the southern coast of Ireland. Her father was William Morgan. He came from the town of Dungarvan in County Waterford. Her mother was Mary Ahern, and Mary came from a small village quite near Waterford City called Port Law. And in 1896, uh, William and Mary married in Port Law. They actually lived there for a little while, but shortly afterwards, uh, times were, I suppose, economically tough, and William uh, joined the army and he was stationed then nearby in Walford City in the barracks and it was there that the four organ children were born. The oldest was Mary, there was two boys Thomas and David and Nellie was the youngest. Nellie was born in Walford on the 24th of August in 1903. Nellie lived there for two years and a bit. I suppose it was here that her fate was formed. Her mother had what we now know to be TB at the time, so she was confined to bed for much of the time. And it was essentially in her mother's bed that Nellie's fate was formed. We know that each morning her father brought her across the road uh, to the chapel in Mount Sion for mass. The family, or William in particular, I suppose, requested a transfer for the sake of his wife's health and they moved to the military installation in Cork Harbour known as Spike Island. In Spike Island, unfortunately, Nellie's mother's health, you know, deteriorated further. She passed away. So after much consultation, it was decided that the children would be sent to various religious institutions. It was decided to keep the two girls together and so they were sent to the Good Shepherd Convent in Sunday's Well. Almost all of the supports, whether it was educational or hospitals or orphanages or any of that, was provided uh, by various religious institutions in the Ireland of that time and indeed for a long time afterwards. Nellie always referred to the nuns in the Good Shepherd as mother. She had a very warm relationship with the sisters. Sister Mary Frances, who was the superior in particular, I mean, it's kind of not the norm for the Reverend Mother of a big convent and a big institution to take such an interest in, in, in a little girl, but Nellie seems to have shone through and the Reverend Mother did take a big interest in her, as did all of the nuns. Nellie always spoke of them as mothers replacing her own mother. Little Nellie came in 1907 and as all children coming into care, even now, the first thing that happens is they have a medical. And she had a medical and they realised she had tuberculosis, just like her mother. But she also had caries disease and curvature of the spine. So she was a very sick little girl. Caries effectively is a, an infection uh, in the gum. So it became quite a serious infection spread to the jaw and it, even to the point of creating a hole at the side of her face. She never complained. And I think at some stage they used to have to scrape away the bone that was disintegrating from her jaw and there was the most foul odour. And she just put up with it or she'd say something like, well, if Jesus could suffer for me, I can suffer for him. Nellie's sole method and motivation in terms of this pain was to offer up all of this suffering. And she did it directly. She spoke to, to Jesus, to the child of Prague. What I am suffering is nothing to what you went through in the cross. In the early days in the Good Shepherd Convent, Nellie was often taught to be, you know, bold, I suppose, because she'd never sit still, which was often a requirement for children at that time in, in education. And uh, of course, she couldn't sit still because she was always struggling to find a comfortable position because of, of the scoliosis that she had. The most serious illness that little Nellie had, though, of course, was TB. That is effectively what uh, brought about her early demise. I know it hurts, but it's going to help your caries.
Are you ready? What impressed me about little Nellie was her spunkiness. She was uh, very um, outgoing, I would say, very interested in people, very interested in people's feelings as well, you know. There was a kind of an ability in her to say sorry, to ask for forgiveness, you know, if she felt she did something wrong. Holy God to Nelly was represented in her mind by and large by the statue of the infant of Prague, which was in her room. And she had a, a remarkable relationship with this statue. The stories related where she played the bugle for this statue and she was delighting in the statue dancing for her. The child of Prague holds the orb and the globe in his hand and she asked the statue to throw the, the, the ball at her and she was slightly reprimanded by one of the nuns who said, well, the statue can't throw the ball at you, Nelly." and Nelly wasn't long coming back saying, he can if he wants to. And she was drawn to the Stations of the Cross, so I suppose as a child, we're, we're used to the verbal and the written and the script, but she, she had to do everything orally and visually and as a small child, and she was really impressed that Holy God had died for her and suffered for her and uh, she seemed to have taken that into the depths of her heart and lived it in, a, in an extraordinary way. She was a little body with a giant faith. She understood what pain was. She understood what loss was. So there was a connection with the passion, a strong connection with the passion and the meaning of the passion which we probably have lost today, that we want to be healthy, well, feel good, look good all the time. And yet she, she has the secret that that is not always possible, that there will be time of abandonment, suffering, pain, loss, but they all have a meaning. She showed us this. There's one story related where the superior of the convent was beginning to see the effect of little Nelly, and I suppose she had reasonable doubts you know uh, is this girl so powerful and has she insights is there powers I suppose to the degree that people are talking about that this little girl has and she said to her fellow sister if Nelly is true and if all of this is real please send us some money for a bakehouse because at that time in the convent day the biggest need was for a, a bakery and uh, the, 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 nun, the nuns had, didn't speak to anybody else about it and lo and behold the very following morning an envelope arrived in at the door of the Good Shepherd Convent in Cork uh, and written on the front of the envelope was for the bakehouse and inside in it was precisely the amount they needed to fund the project. Sometime later one of the sisters came in she said there are two other nuns in my community and I'd like to request that you would pray for them. They were both elderly nuns and not doing too well at the time. And Nelly looked up at the Reverend Mother and said, well, one of them will recover, but the other will, will not, and will be going to Holy God quite soon. And I need hardly relate to you that that's exactly what happened. Blessed Eucharist was a factor in Nellie's life and in Nellie's mind almost from the off as soon as she had any rational thought. Even going back to when her father used to bring her across to the church outside the barracks in Waterford. And I remember she's only a little over two years old at this stage, tripping across in her, in her daddy's arms. And just as they would get to the edge of the barracks, there was a lockup, and her father explained that this was a little cell that soldiers who might not be behaving or maybe came back from town a little later than they should have the night before, but a little, a little cell they'd be put into to calm down, cool off, and uh, they'd be left out when they'd be behaving a little better again. So this came out later when, you know, Nelly used to frequently ask in the Good Shepherd convent to be brought down to the chapel, and she always focused on the tabernacle. And in her own childish way, she was a little upset, I guess, that 
she didn't like the idea of Jesus being confined to the lockup. You know, she said, "Well, you know, it, it's, it's too small. Why, why have him confined? And uh, you know, he, he's bigger than that little box." She seemed to be tuned into God always. So it was her desire to receive Holy Communion. It was either Thanksgiving, it was kissing her nurse or one of the sisters and being able to say, you've got Holy God in you. There was an attendant, Mary Long, who used to look after her. And Mary used to go to Mass each morning. And uh, when she'd come back, Nellie got a habit of inviting her over. And because Mary had received Communion, she wanted a kiss from her. One morning, Mary, for whatever reason, didn't get to Mass. But she did turn up in the cottage at the usual time, and the minute she clicked the door, she went to come over to Nellie as normal, expecting Nellie to be looking for a kiss. And Nellie admonished her, put up the hand and said, No, Longy, you didn't get Holy Communion this morning. And she wasn't interested in the kiss. She was in this little room up the spiral stairs, and she would say, Holy God isn't in the lockup today. She would know there was exposition. And if she was well enough, they'd bring her down and she'd point and say, there's Holy God. And she would just stare at the Blessed Sacrament in adoration. She expressed in every way she could the longing to make Holy Communion. But of course, this was impossible. She was only heading towards uh, four years of age at this stage. And at this time, you know, the age of receiving communion was up nearer to the 12 stroke 14 mark, depending on what part of the world you were at. But despite that, it became talked about Nellie's devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. And one day, there was a Jesuit, Father Bury, down from Dublin, giving a retreat in the convent to the nuns. And he got to hear about this little girl. And uh, so much so that he went to interview her himself. And in interviewing her, he was blown away by her understanding of the Blessed Sacrament. She said, what is the Blessed Sacrament? It is, it is God, it is he who makes everyone holy. It comes into me, comes down into my heart and makes me holy. So much so that he came back and he, he said, this girl fully understands what the Blessed Sacrament is about and has a, a real longing to make Holy Communion. Her desire seemed to grow and grow inside in her to receive it. Oh, I'm longing to have him. I'm longing to have Holy God in me. He got in contact with the bishop's office across the city, kind of asked, could he be given special permission to give Holy Communion to this child? And the following morning at breakfast, uh, a knock came to the door again. There was a note for the priest. And lo and behold, Bishop O'Callaghan, who had actually met Nellie a little while before and he was astonished by the story of Nellie also because he had come to confirm her when she was quite sick, which is a common enough thing. Children often got confirmed if they were very ill. And out of the blue, he gave permission. So there was crazy excitement in the convent. The whole place was being got ready. This little four-year-old girl was going to make communion. So on the 6th of December, 1907, history was made when Father Bury gave Nellie her first Holy Communion. It became a big event in Cork City. I mean, songs were written about this. I have sheet music even still to this day, and they were sold. You know, you bought sheet music of, of, of songs celebrating whatever it was at the time. This became an event. And I suppose it, it's the single thing that sets Nelly apart was receiving communion at, at so young an age. People report, you know, that she was in a virtual state of ecstasy after receiving, and she would remain quiet. Obviously, she would be fasting beforehand, and, but, but even the contemplation afterwards. She spent a lot of time in silence preparing to receive Holy Communion, and she was in silence afterwards, and she wouldn't want to speak before receiving Holy Communion. I mentioned earlier that uh, the nuns had to come and disinfect this wound uh, each day, and it wasn't a pleasant duty, but they reported that after Nelly received her first Holy Communion, that never after was it a problem. Yes, they came and they continued to dress the, the wound, but the smell entirely disappeared and the infection was nowhere uh, like what it had been prior to she receiving Holy Communion. She would long for Holy Communion every day and um, had a sense that God was in her. So the imminence of God or the indwelling of God seemed to be her spirituality, that she knew that when you received Holy Communion you had God within you 
and she wanted to spend quality time in silence. Nellie didn't live actually that long after receiving her communion. I estimate that if she, ha if she received communion every day and they report that she did, that she got communion 33 times, which is very easy to remember once for every year that our Lord spent on the earth. Thereafter, Nellie received communion. It was brought to her in her room because she was sick. And it's very well recorded, you know, the, the reverend preparation that she made all night. Now you have to fast for an hour beforehand. People say, well, the priest will be half an hour. So that's when you, 30 minutes before we get in, which should be grand, you know. But at this time, you fasted from midnight the night before. And Nellie took this very, very seriously. And uh, indeed, she wouldn't talk to anyone from midnight. And she spent most of the night in preparation and contemplation before she was to receive uh, the Eucharist, offering up her sufferings. Um, and, you know, she was very, very much certain of what the Blessed Eucharist meant to her and she was very ready for it when she received it. Hello, Nelly. Hello. We made this card for you. Nelly, will you please pray for our family? <coughs> of course I will. Thank you. Can you give us a blessing also? Yes. For a lot of the month of January of 1908, it was apparent that Nellie's health was deteriorating. And she actually spent a lot of the few weeks before her death trying to soothe the nuns who were coming in and often getting upset like at the inevitable situation that was unfolding in front of them. Many, many people came to visit her bedside. We have photographs from the time showing cards and votive offerings and letters left behind by many hundreds of people who wrote to the convent, arrived at the door, all to get blessings from this little girl, seeking favours, etc. There's, there's a recorded instance of a priest coming in, seeking her blessing and he kneeling in front of her and no bother at all to little Nelly. She dipped her finger in the holy water and she put the sign of the cross and he said, God bless you, Father. The nuns again were recording a lot of what she was saying. She actually foretold her own death because she said to them that, you know, she would be going very soon. And uh, when, when one of the nuns kind of said, no, Nelly, that, that's nonsense, you, you know, you'll be grand. She was under no illusions, affirming that she was happy to go, that she was offering all of the suffering that she had to Jesus in reparation and in prayer. And she foretold that she would go to meet him on his own day. And of course, his own day was a Sunday. Just a few days later, on Sunday the 2nd of February, uh, 1908, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, uh, after being agitated for a lot of the morning, she suddenly became calm after that long agony. And she lay there with her eyes open, her hands out in prayer most of the time, and she was praying silently. They could see, they couldn't make out what she was saying, but they could see the lips in silent prayer. And it was as if, as if she was uh, fixated on something about a meter above the foot of her little cot. She stayed that way for an hour, remaining motionless, her gaze fixed on this position. And then at the end of that hour, an extraordinary look of joy and tears came to her eyes, her lips moving. And at four o'clock, after one hour, with a smile, they said, of perfect satisfaction, Nellie raised her eyes and she flew to God. At the time of her death, Nellie was just four years, five months, 
and the eight days old. So she packed an awful lot into a life so small. Nelly was originally interred in Ballyfehan, down near the city centre in Cork City in St. Joseph's Cemetery, resting there for about a year and a half. And during this year and a half, stories emerged of the extraordinary happenings with this little girl, and people started coming to visit her grave. It happened to such a degree that it became literally a matter of civil unrest. Uh, so many people were coming, almost queues at times, and the cemetery used to close at either seven or eight o'clock each evening, whatever it was, but the, the authorities who were closing it were complaining that people weren't leaving on time, that they were coming to the grave and they wouldn't get out. People were reporting cures at the grave and leaving crutches and votive offerings and all sorts of things at the grave. So this was all going on. At the same time, the nuns, I think, were beginning to regret having let their little Nelly go. So they were in consultation with the authorities and they decided that uh, on the 9th of September, quietly, just four people present, the Reverend Mother, a doctor to certify matters, a priest, and of course the grave digger who was, who was necessary, exhumed little Nelly a year and a half after her death. And when they did so, they found that the body was perfectly intact. Her hair had grown some. Her face, which had scars, particularly in the jaw for, for the disease of caries at the time of her death, had completely vanished and was absolutely fine. After they exhumed Nelly in Ballyfahan, they brought her back to Sunday's Well, to the Good Shepherd Convent, where she was buried in September to a by now much bigger funeral because her fame had grown. In the intervening time after Lily's death, her story continued to flourish and more and more people came to know of this extraordinary little girl in Cork. And many pamphlets were published which were kind of synopsis of her life and of the extraordinary happenings. And one such made its way to Rome where Cardinal Mary del Val, who was the Pope's secretary at the time, read the account and he was very taken by it and Cardinal Del Val brought it back to uh, the Vatican and uh, he gave it, it was a magazine called Roma, he gave the little account to the Pope and Pope Pius X, Saint Pope Pius X, read this account and the minute he, he read it, he turned to Del Val and he said, there it is, that's the sign that we've been waiting for. Shortly after this, in August 1910, the Pope promulgated Quam Singulari, and Quam Singulari was a very important edict from Pius X, all to do with children, but very specifically reducing the age at which children throughout the world could receive Holy Communion. Unless we become like little children, unless in humility we accept this is the truth, that Jesus is present in the, in the Eucharist, Jesus is alive, that it's not a myth, it's not a, an abstract. It's true because as Jesus touched people when he was on earth, he's touching us still. He's, he's reaching out to, to us to say, believe in me. We must realize that God is our Father and that Mary is our mother. Divine filiation, we are children of God. And little Nellie, in her simplicity and yet in her profundity, teaches us a little bit more about divine filiation, about that, that trust in, in God which she had, and that great love of the sacrament, the Eucharist, which she had, and desiring to receive Jesus. She has a message today, she has a message for the future, and I think her message is very particular and can give hope to young people. And I think it should give hope to Ireland as well, because Ireland was part of her story, and God knows Ireland could do with some good news now. I have here, in fact, a little piece of uh, a bedsheet which little Nelly had. It's my own little relic to be close to her. And in every Mass, honestly, that I say, I try to remember little Nelly of Holy God in the list of saints, even though she's not a saint, shall we say, officially, but I say it privately to myself, just as, a, as an intention 
where she can help me and hopefully help you to have a deeper finesse, a greater love of the Mass, where Jesus is there with us and wants to be in us and in our lives more and more.